All righty. <laughs> Welcome back to the nine questions. Um, we're going to be doing good. To keep this to nine. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> just straight up honest with you. I am just absolutely thrilled to have mm -hmm. um, Irisana Moon with us today. Um, she's an author of eight plus books. I know you've got more in little anthologies. You and do. You're a witch, priestess, <laughs> international teacher. I know you just got back from Australia. Mm -hmm. um, initiate in the reclaiming tradition, a devotee of Ar Aphrodite, Hecate, mm -hmm. the Norns, and Iris. And you've been practicing magic for 20 plus years. After a certain point, you just put a plus and just let it I'm roll. I'm just doing I'm that. Just... Yeah, I'm not. We're not counting anymore. No. <laughs> You're passionate about the idea that life um, and humans are love spells, ever experiencing the dance of desire and connection, moving in and out of the heart, always returning to love. Your teaching and facilitation style is immersive, gracious, safe, and welcoming. Welcome. <laughs> Speaking of welcoming, thank you for thank you. taking time out. This is going to be so awesome. All right, so I'm going right. to jump right in. Do um, it. I'm ready. What, explain to me what heart magic is. <laughs> yeah, so heart magic is evolving. <laughs> so from the first time that I talked about it sort of offhandedly and off the cuff in a podcast, I just sort of made it up in the moment. Um, what it looks like to me in this moment is this idea that the heart offers different levels of engagement. It offers the levels of how do I devote and take care of myself and my own heart? How do I relate to the gods and resourcing from their knowledge, wisdom, experience, magic? And then how do I work with the heart in terms of the community and going outwards with that? So an inwards, sort of upwards, outwards um, magic that it creates um, a place for compassion for ourselves, compassion for others, also creates a space where we can engage in love in different ways um, at different times of our life. So I heard one time, and you can probably help expand on this because you're, you're much more researched than I am, but I know the, from what I understand, the Greeks had three different <laughs> main, three different words for love. They have 10, okay, like every well, time I, I go to look them up, there are more. So to be fair, <laughs> every time I go, there's more. <laughs> I just did um, an online witch camp um, last weekend. Yeah, last weekend. And we were talking about love um, and I went to relook up that list and then I found 10. I was like, oh dear, every <laughs> time I go, there's another one. So 10 question mark. Wow. Um, and, and they all mean different things like love a brother, mm -hmm. love a family, love. So it's not a, it's a specific type, whereas we just, in, in, in the infinite laziness of Americans, just say love. Yeah. <laughs> Simplicity, laziness. Yeah, that's okay. all true. And it makes, tomato, it, tomato. it makes it confusing. Yeah. It makes it confusing. No, I agree yeah. with you. It's like, um, you know, other languages have, you know, multiple words for the same word because it depends on the tone and it depends on the context and it. Um, but the Greeks have, you know, everything from romantic love to friendship to family to things that are out of duty or obligation, um, the sort of stalkerish <laughs> love. Um, and also, um, what was the one that I really like? This one that's like love of self and the idea of just being at home with yourself is one of them too. Mm. It's one of the newer ones. Um and also like flirting and like different levels of engagement. And it's not just romantic. It's not just erotic. It's also um, love is a connection and it's about connections. Like who am I connected to? Who am I committed to being connected to? We should bring that back because right. I mean, there's, there's so many times you have to there's, almost throw yeah. an asterisk every time you say that to somebody. <laughs> it's so <laughs> you know, true. I know. You know, it's like, no, I don't love you. Love you. I just, like you love you, you know? right <laughs> I was you know I was having a conversation with someone the other day about their definition of love and my definition of love these days is that you know depending on the relationship um my version of love now looks like I support your growth I support who you're becoming and I'm here to root you on and I'm here because I care and I want to be there for you in the times when it's hard and I would be there in the times when it's great but that's also love I think we think, I think sometimes there's a cultural thing of that love is a, is a thing and it's actually an action. Mm, uh, it's yeah. what I'm doing. It's a verb. Yeah, exactly. So it's like barbecue, barbecue's a verb. 
It's right. not a noun. Right. I mean, it's also <laughs> that, but it's like, but it is love is, um, you know, love is an action. Love is showing up. It's the doing. Um, I can say love all I want, but if I'm not showing up and doing it, I think that that's not quite what you're doing. I would re-examine what you're defining that relationship as. So speaking of love and relationships, I know that we had just mentioned you being a devotee of Aphrodite. Now, uh-huh. <laughs> I know enough, I don't know a lot, but I know <laughs> enough about the gods that what we think they are is not what they are. And mm-hmm. just because they seem fluffy, okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Air quotes, big time. Oh. Um, mm-hmm. They're not um, mm-hmm. at all. Um mm-hmm. And I think that in in my experience with the, you know, dealing, working, being worked on, Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of edges to a lot of them. The ones that you think that are, I don't want to say safe because that's not really a good word to use. But it's the word that's used. Yeah. Right. But I don't think that's, (laughs) I I don't, you know, I mean, your, your word's your word. You know, when you work with, you know, you're working with a deity, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. but what is that like? Aphrodite. Yeah. Can you, can you talk Mm, a little bit about that? Yeah. Oh, I can talk about it a lot. Um, Here's what I would say. I did not want to work with her for that very reason. Mm. I was very committed to uh, working with the difficult gods. I wanted to work with Hecate. I wanted to work with, you know, other ones that aren't coming to my brain in this moment, Caridwen, things like that. Um, I thought Aphrodite was a Barbie. I thought Mm. she was really fluffy and really superficial. And I was like, no way. Um, but through a series of events, she, um, led me to like, maybe we should, you should probably work with me. And what I thought was going to be easy and sort of really comforting. And sometimes it is, uh, ended up being incredibly challenging and initiatory, um, because if you ask anybody what, how hard is it to love yourself? Ooh. Real hard. Yeah. Real hard. <laughs> can that be, is yeah. not, That's not superficial work. Um, it is looking at shadow. It is looking at things you don't want to look at. And also questioning what beauty is, questioning what love is, questioning what it means to you, what it means in your relationships, um, et cetera. So she's, she's a hard one. She's also very, um, a lot of times I think her picture and things like that is very like love, erotic, and that's all there is. And if you read stories about her, she's an absolute jerk and she is jealous and spiteful and all of that, which to me makes her relatable and makes it not as much of a, you know, this ideal version of love. Love is also all these other things. It makes us do dumb things. It makes us make bad choices. Um, and hopefully we learn from them. Well, getting back to our language difficulty, right? Mm-hmm. You look at a word, you know, you say love, but I know I will use because I'm in the midst of being dealing with this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's passion, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, yes. and passion. The first thing you think of is is eroticism, but what you don't realize that you also have obsession. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, an obsession's mm-hmm. not always mm-hmm. a good thing, yeah. right? You, you know, mm-hmm. and passion's not always a good thing because you end up being tunnel vision. And yeah, so mm-hmm. I'm, I can, I never really thought about it. So, so thanks for kind of mm-hmm. unpacking that a little bit. That's yeah. just... Eros or mania. Yeah. And I think that they both have things to offer, but also lessons to offer. And I think anything that's too much is too much. And I think that there is... Uh, a lot of value in stepping into things that are a little big because you understand what you don't want Mm -hmm. or you understand how that doesn't work or maybe it does (laughs) I don't want to say anything for anybody but um, mania sounds exhausting (laughs) so (laughs) I I, I totally support figuring out what you don't want I I just because I think that's a lesson I think people don't want to take the time yeah to, to work on in, in today's, in, I don't say people, that's kind of, that's a judgment and I'm sorry, I didn't mean it that way. There seems to be from my limited experience with folks now mm-hmm. that looking for shortcuts, Absolutely. you know, and mm-hmm. I'm about, well, as you know, I'm about the work, you right. know, because mm-hmm. I think that's where the growth is, 
you know, mm-hmm. and growth is pain. Yes. Often. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't know how mm-hmm. else to say it. Growth sucks. Growth <laughs> sucks. <laughs> moving, moving beyond what you know is uncomfortable. Yeah. And, and it causes don't, pain. Yeah, yeah. We don't like uncomfort. I, oh, I don't no. like it. You know, mm-hmm. I'm, no, mm-hmm. of course not. Nothing. But I mean, that's one of the things that I say a lot is that discomfort is an ally because yeah. it shows you where you're growing. It actually shows you I'm in a place that I haven't been before. And that doesn't necessarily mean you're in the right place, but it does mean that you're in a place that's different. And I think that's good information. Yeah. And, and finding out what you don't want means you don't have to do that anymore. So yeah. I don't know what I want, but I know what I don't want. So now let's yes. check that off the list. <laughs> exactly. I think there's such a focus on, you know, getting what you want, getting what you want, getting what you want. It's just as important to say, I don't want that. I'm very clear that I don't want this. And I, so let's, you know, recenter myself so that I can focus on what's important to me. So what are you most excited about now? These days, hmm, I'm excited about um, actually, so I have this whole image in my head of um, life as a love spell becoming a little bit bigger it's been in I've been working on that sort of phrase and that magic since 2016 Uh, a friend and I were teaching at a witch camp in Australia and that phrase um, came out of a conversation that we had and we were doing the story of Demeter and Persephone and he said something to the effect of like the love spell of life and I said and then that day I created a song called life is a love spell and then that sort of became a thing I just recently saw him a couple of weeks ago and we decided we're going to build that out a little bit and actually talk about what we've talked about, he and I all the time, Um, but we're going to build it out a little bit and see, kind of introduce it as a bigger sort of, I don't know what the right word is right now. And I don't know what he would say, so I don't want to speak for him, but I would say that it's a magic that really um, intersects with a lot of things that are going on in the world. And that is beyond the romantic stuff. Um, It's not just love, love. Um, as it might be, it is a framework in which I think I personally have been able to find resilience. I have been able to refine and find again hope. Um, And I've also learned to be more forgiving or compassionate towards myself and towards other folks, because we're all in this big old mess together. And how can we Mm -hmm. dance with each other? Um, So that's what I'm always excited about. (laughs) So I'm always, it's always like, it's always somewhere in my brain uh, to work on that and to bring that, you know, just get a little louder. I get a little bit more confident every year and a little less concerned what what people think. (laughs) So, so we just grow. Yeah. Growth. Mm -hmm. We're back to that again. This is going to be a theme in it. (laughs) It is. That's where, that's where I'm living these days is growth and What's your biggest pet peeve? In general? Yeah. In witchcraft? Yeah. Just. That's a really great question. My biggest pet peeve. I think I would have to say it is someone who will not be deterred in what they believe, even in the face of other information. Ooh. Yeah, that's a. That can fit a lot of scenarios right now. <laughs> it's, it's... Mm-hmm. I'm not a fan. <laughs> I, I think... I'm sorry. I mean... I'm not laughing at you. It's just oh, that no. I, I'm laughing at all the things that are going in my head right now as examples. Uh, yeah, I just think that it's a pet peeve. Of you can't... You know, I don't expect people to change their minds all the time, but at least being open to the fact that maybe this is also true. Um, I think that, I don't think as a culture, we're taught that two truths can be can be happening at the same time. Um, and it's actually a really great uh, mental health tool <laughs> to be able to hold multiple truths at the same time. Not that you need to live by this one, you can stick with your own. And also, you know, this other person's story might be incredibly true for them. But at least I can also listen to it and kind of, you know, invalidate it and say that that's also okay, um, unless it's damaging and oppressive and all of that. But um, side note. Right. um, Yeah, I think that that is my biggest pet peeve in general, in witchcraft, in life, in relationships, in the world. I've got a 
I'll break it out from time to time of a mm-hmm. Facebook profile. And it's, mm-hmm. it's a cylinder that they shine a light on from two different directions. Mm-hmm. Shows against the wall, one area, it's a circle. And shows against the other wall, it's a square. Mm-hmm. And it says, this is true and this is also true. Depends on, yeah, anyway, all right. It depends. I mean, it depends on the consequence, you know, the circumstances in which you live, what your stories are, what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. When I'm pissed off, I look for things that make me mad, right? And so it's always going to change. And I think that being able and willing to be flexible and adaptable is just crucial for good mental health and uh, effective um, collaboration with folks. Hmm. Flexible. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, I should have, I need a whiteboard up here to where I can start writing. Growth, <laughs> <Notes>. flexibility. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So how long have you been writing? Writing? Mm-hmm. I mean, we could, we could say the story that I've been writing since I could write when I was a kid. Um, Started out as true. a child. Yeah. That's also true. I wrote a lot of stories when I was a kid. I wrote a lot of poems. I wrote... Uh, whenever folks offered a writing assignment, I always took that one as opposed to art or anything else. Um, but I started, you know, writing professionally. Um, I actually, it's my living too. Uh, I started writing professionally in 2005. And I was just in that mode where everybody was doing SEO and blogs and things like that. So it was really a good time to start that and was really successful uh, and all that. I just walked out of another job and said, I'm gonna make this work. And uh, much to my now ex's uh, chagrin uh, that I did that, but I also did make it work. (laughs) And um, yeah, so I've written a whole bunch of things, but I started writing for uh, Moon Books, I think in 2013. I think that's true. What a decade. I know I didn't realize that either until Sorry, I, I didn't mean to bring that up. So. No, no, I didn't realize it either until the other day. I was like, because I wrote, um, oh, I can't remember if it was for uh, The Name of the Goddess or Paganism 101, one of their anthologies. Um, they had posted something on Facebook and I was like, oh yeah, I'll do it. And I can't remember which one. But one of those I think was in about 2013. And then from there, I just kept doing anthologies with them. And then they're like, hey, we don't have anything on reclaiming. Would you be willing to write something? And so I wrote that book first. And so knowing what you know now, mm-hmm. what do you wish you would have known when you started? Mm-hmm. Writing? Yeah. I wish I would have known. The whole book business mm-hmm. and all the authoring, the professional side. <laughs> I still don't know anything about that. Uh, what would I want to have known? Uh, it would have been helpful to know that it's more than just writing these days. It's also being your own marketing person. Uh, it's, it's a bigger job than just being a writer. And I think sometimes I, it may come across as I, I'm complaining about that. Um, mm-hmm. I, al- wow, I also I mean, do just... like, I also do like that, but really my passion is writing. And if I'd known there was, less writing than I thought there was. <laughs> then, um, I just, I don't know if it would have changed anything. I'm pretty stubborn and I always have wanted to publish a book. So I was pretty set. Um, I don't think you could have steered me away. And I think that would have been interesting to know ahead of time. Um, I think that that definitely would change the way I've spoken about my books and interacted um, online and in person. So you've mentioned it a couple of times and I have a fairly good pseudo knowledge of it, but I would care to guess a lot of folks don't. Can you explain the reclaiming tradition? (laughs) I've got friends that were heavily involved with it, like Uh I said, back in the 90s, early 2000s, and they were teaching at Witch Camp and they were, you know, Mm -hmm. all that. So I have a, I have a little bit of an eye. I have, you know, that type of knowledge, what I've gotten from them. So I know you've actually written a book on it. Mm-hmm. couple so, mm-hmm. yeah talk mm-hmm. about that what is what is reclaiming yeah. what's reclaiming so that's yeah. the big question know, right? so so reclaiming you know to define it you could talk about it in terms of how it evolved um you know back in 70s 80s 
Uh, things the were days of point. your. The days of your. <laughs> I always try to add that in and wherever I can. I just love it's saying true. That. That's great. I think that's the perfect setup. <laughs> um, there were a lot of things happening in the Bay Area, in San Francisco, California, in the Bay Area. There was activism, a lot of activist, environmental activism. There was Mount Diablo, a lot of protests and actions and things like that. And, you know, the goddess spirituality was coming was coming back into flow. It was starting in a lot of the schools were offering different courses in that. Um, there was also a lot of the human potential movement, a lot of, you know, also a lot of activism around racism and various other oppressions. Um, and basically it was like in the Bay Area, there was kind of this cauldron of like people getting together that were all sort of looking for something to uh, either help um, their different causes or to just help them personally. And to make a very long story short, uh, you know, Starhawk um, wrote The Spiral Dance mm -hmm. and that was published, um, you know, back in, now I can't remember, but it was a while ago, 1979, I think that's true. Wow. Um, because it's a few-ish. So 1979, I think. And sorry, reclaimers, I don't have it in front of me. Um, so that was published and that book came out of her own studies with fairy tradition and her own study of witchcraft and her work and her dissertation and things like that when she was in school. And so Spiral Dance um, outlined um, a tradition of witchcraft that was being practiced among her and other folks. There were different covens and groups getting together and people were doing rituals as part of protests. And people were like, I want to know how to do rituals. I want to know how to do this. And so Star, Starhawk and Diane Baker and a bunch of other folks um, were also involved in creating Reclaiming. Um, they started to offer classes. So there's this class called Elements of Magic, which basically is still around. Mm -hmm. It has, it says, here's how Reclaiming does magic. Here's how we do ritual. Here is the culture of Reclaiming. Here is here are the parts that are important um, for you to know in order to be an effective ritualist and how to sort of work together in community. It includes everything from reclaim, uh, ritual planning, consensus, things like that. Um, but basically, a whole bunch of people took this class and were like, this was great, but can we do more? <laughs> and so more classes sprung out of that um, based on the fairy tradition, F-E-R-I, and Victor and Cora Anderson. Um, and because Star had been initiated in fairy and brought forward some of that work. And so basically a lot of classes emerged and then all these people were practicing or claiming witchcraft. It was this big diffuse sort of thing, but it started to spread out beyond the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. And people began to feel like they weren't getting, they weren't part of like decision-making and things like that unless they were in the Bay Area. So there was this weird like situation that happened and um, in the Bay Area, there was a collective, and those were the folks who were making decisions for the whole, not a tradition yet. Um, and people were feeling un uneasy about that, to make another long story short. Um, from all this conversation, uh, the Principles of Unity was born. And the Principles of Unity is a document that has been revised a couple of times. And it basically says, here's the things that you need to agree to in order to be a reclaiming witch. And no matter what, as long as you adhere to this, you can call yourself that. Great. Um, we're not an initiatory tradition. Um, you do not need to be initiated to teach, to take on a ritual role. Anybody can do it. Anybody can be in a position of leadership. Um, there is initiation, though, um, if that's a thing for you. Um, so basically, the collective, you know, and a lot of other folks got together, made the principles of unity, and then dissolved the collective because it was like, nope, reclaiming runs free. And... <laughs> Now it's a tradition that is all over the world. You've mentioned, like I've taught mm -hmm. in Australia, I've taught in the UK. There's uh, groups in France, Belgium, um, Brazil has a really large um, group going on right now. US, Canada, um, I already said Australia. And there's I know there's some folks uh, across Europe and I know I had at least one student from Japan. So um, pretty, pretty widespread, right? Mm -hmm. And Basically what I would say reclaiming is, is a tradition of witchcraft that celebrates folks who are willing to not only look at themselves, but also look at their impact on others. 
Mm. Um, there is a practice called the, the thing that we say is you're your own spiritual authority in community or rooted in community. How I do trance might look completely different from someone else, and that's okay. And how you do it might impact other people in the community. So, yes, you can do your own thing. And uh, where's the impact? Um, over the years, we've also grown to include, uh, the POU has been changed to include folks who don't work with deity, because we're not necessarily a deist tradition, um, work with mysterious ones. That got added. Also language around trans and language around different gender histories also came into the POU because that wasn't there in the beginning. And then last within the last couple of years, I can't remember the date, um, there was language around the fact that we're an anti-racist tradition and being more solid about what we said about that because our POU used to say something that was um, very pacifist and people in our tradition, people of color in our tradition were like, that doesn't work for me. I um, might have to engage in violence to protect myself. So the POU got changed um, in order to hold that too and to make a very clear statement about the tradition's um, stance. So we have a living tradition that changes as it needs to. Yes, it's so exciting. Mm -hmm. it's evolving mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what why <laughs> <laughs> no um oh, mm. <laughs> it's like why don't why don't more you know why why can't we have more of this in in other communities to where because it's more it, inclusive versus exclusive because it takes a lot of hard conversations to get to this point oh. and a lot of folks don't like to do that Hard the tradition, I mean, reclaiming <laughs> has had a lot of really hard things and it has had some really hard conversations. People have left the tradition because it has not supported them. And the, like there is, you know, absolutely white supremacy that's in different things because it's, you know, that, it, it, that is. Quote that it just is. It's everywhere. Like yeah. white supremacy is not the shark, it's the water. Yeah. My one of my favorite quotes. Yes. Like it, it's everywhere. And yeah, reclaiming is an evolving tradition and it continues to be because there are different, you know, we're very young for one. And so there are elders who um, are, we've lost a few elders this year. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's different voices now, there's different contexts in which our tradition is happening and interacts with. And also there are different cultures that our tradition interacts with. What happens in Australia is way different than Brazil, is way different than Canada, is different than the Bay Area. And so it needs to be able to, or I think our tradition wants to be able to hold all of that. And we do it imperfectly, but I think that's a good well, it's starting humans. point. Mm -hmm. it's humans, it's mm -hmm. going to be imperfect at, at times. Absolutely. You know, it's just how you how do you deal with it? it you do know, you, when do you keep showing up? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I talk a lot about reclaim. Like I, I taught some when I taught something that last weekend, I said something to the effect of. I was talking about relationships and about how things are challenging and moving in and out of that is challenging and it requires like dedication, commitment and a bit of humility and sometimes delusion. Um, but reclaiming is like that. I have loved reclaiming a lot of the time and I've hated it sometimes. And it's just part of it because. I have that same relationship with my deity. Right? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, oh, I, ugh, yeah, you know, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it's just, I don't know how it, to, to me it's all it, it's actually refreshing mm -hmm. you know that we do have mm -hmm. traditions people i won't say traditions because i think there's I think there's more to it than that that people yeah, are yeah. willing to have those hard conversations because mm -hmm. it's hard you know yeah. i mean our society our culture you know we live so much in the now mm -hmm. in trying to figure out what's tomorrow but mm -hmm. we don't give ourselves enough credit i think sometimes at, as a community I'm going to say pagan is an overall arching umbrella to include, mm -hmm. you know, heathenry. A lot, a lot of, you know, I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not excluding anybody w w right. when I say that, but I know that mm -hmm. it has grown and changed a lot since the 90s, since oh, the yeah. 2000s, Absolutely. you know, and our culture has changed a lot mm -hmm. since mm -hmm. the 90s and the 2000s. It, it, 
it really doesn't it is un, would be unfair mm -hmm. i think to mm -hmm. hold those 90s principles in 2020 2025 yep. what okay. yeah, i mean it's just you know Mm -hmm. no, that's we're, just... we're, we're different people and i think that what happens is the more you build community or collaborate within a community the more you hear stories of how people are impacted by the way community is held and i think that that just and it changes you know folks have different gender histories folks have different um you know financial situations that have happened through the pandemic things have happened like things change and so i think we shouldn't be wedded to what tradition looks like necessarily like what does that mean like tradition is just your ancestors yelling at you or something I can't remember but like something to that effect and you know I'm open to change I'm open to being um, led in a different direction be open <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I lost track of them but no yeah. I mean I just I think it's great but I mean okay so <clears throat> in the midst of chaos right because I mean mm -hmm. I don't, I think it's hard to call where we are right now anything, but, you know, it's simmered chaos. I mean, if you're, you know, anyway, don't, um, what's that saying that I absolutely love? Facts don't care about your feelings. Yeah. <laughs> um, sure. How do you work on your self care? You know, in the midst of, of <laughs> everything, you know, cause I, you know, just the jet lag would make me, Go nuts. I don't like to fly. Um, you know, but you know, when you're changing time zones, you're you got all this stuff going on, you're midst of writing probably four books at one time, you know, stuff being published in your marketing, and you've got a lot going on. How do you wh what is it that you do that enables you mm -hmm. to have a good self-care to mm -hmm. where you can make because that's important because then I mean, without mm -hmm. you being yes. rooted, the rest of that stuff doesn't doesn't work. Or it's very my, my opinion in, yes. in my world. If <laughs> I ain't got my shit together and my my relationship right with her, the rest mm -hmm. of my world doesn't work. No, no, it becomes uh, unnecessarily unnecessarily difficult. Uh, I it think It becomes window dressing. You know, oh yeah, yeah. Anyway, I won't get into yeah. That, but, well, yeah. so the question originally was like, you know, how do you how do you do self care imperfectly? <laughs> um, I think that. Um, one of the things that's really helped me recently is that I rephrased self-care as self-devotion. Oh, no, I like that. I remember seeing it. Yeah, I was. Yeah, thank you, because I wanted to bring that yeah. up. So now I don't have to. Great. Great. <laughs> and I think that that for me has made it easier and more important to prioritize that. Mm -hmm. Because I will devote to deity like nothing, right? Oh, the deities. And I will altars and offerings and all that other stuff. To myself, I'm like, mm, you'll be fine. Yeah. And I and I think Rubs that the dirt you know, on it. right. And I think <laughs> that one of the things that's true for me is that I don't believe the divine is bigger, like over me. I think that we're in relationship. Um, they know more. They have more perspective. Definitely, they've got some things to tell me. And also, I don't supplicate. You know, I'm I'm in devotion. And so, thinking about myself, if I'm in devotion to myself, what do I need? in order to do this service, what do I truly need and, and also desire? Um, I work with Aphrodite. We say desire too. Um, I personally um, have to be pretty consistent with caring for my physical body before anything else. Uh, I'm not great at it. Uh, I, I do know <laughs> I, I, I waver. But what I would say is that for me, physically is the first thing. Like, am I, I have to move every day. That's a big thing. I have to exercise in some way or else none of this works. Um, I have to get enough sleep. I don't always. Um, I have to watch what I eat. I don't always. Um, I have to be in a good relationship with my deities in terms of, am I being reciprocal in my relationship? Like, am I offering to as much as I am receiving? You mean they're not a vending machine? Not a gumball machine is what I say. <laughs> the gods are not gumball machines. No. I'm going to put in a dollar and get me a whatchamacallit. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I was just talking. I was just did a presentation this morning about that. I was like, yeah, it's not. You know, if I just devote enough, then something pops out. 
that's not true. <laughs> and so I'm just like this, I can do all the self-care in the world and sometimes I'm just tired. So um, a lot of the things are really like basic self-care, but they're also like boundaries that I have. Like I don't, I try not to schedule myself too much. Um, I try to have writing be something that is the only thing I do that day. Hmm. Um, so I have a job and so, and you know, books don't quite make the bills. Um, so I have to write like on the weekends. And so I just block out times that I'm not, in, not interrupted and those get to be the times. And then it's a special thing. And for me, that feels like devotion. Like I'm giving this time to this particular thing and nothing else will get in the way of it. And everything else will be turned off and I will make sure I've slept well or tried, or I will make sure I'm fed well. Um, and I give myself over to those moments in devotion because that is what is important to me in that moment. Um, I can't focus on everything at the same time. I cannot. I also have ADHD, found that out last year. A lot of, a lot of sense making that was. Um, so I, I'm also very good at being a little chaotic, <laughs> um, but it's not very sustainable. So I think that blocking out time is always a thing, making sure when I do bigger projects or events or witch camps that I am creating time to decompress ahead of time mm. and also after. There's a lot of privilege in that, absolutely. Um, but it is really something I need. I can't take weeks and weeks off, but I can at least take a day to not, to let things, let the snow globe settle a bit to write things out and to sort of, I don't know, figure out what I think about something before I move on to something else. Um, in terms of how I do all the books and things like that, I do them one at a time. I'm very much a one book at a time person. I can't switch back and forth. Um, but I also just sit down and do. I do not, I don't get writer's block. I don't, I just turn something on in my brain. Uh, I think it's years of freelance writing and you had to do, mm -hmm. you had to be on. There's like no, but also I don't start books until I'm ready. So there's also that. Um, but uh, other self-devotion practices, being clear about the reality of my life is a big self-devotion practice. I only have so much time. I only have so much money. I mean, that's you. <laughs> and how do I want to spend that? Literally and figuratively. Um, how, do, how do I want to feel? Uh, a lot of my writing is about love and it is about that devotional aspect that requires a lot of my life to also include times where I'm doing that for myself and where I'm feeling that, where I'm feeling connected, where I'm doing magic that is serving that magic, um, is that serving that feeling. Um, I have to very actively um, cultivate joy in my life because I'm very much a worker bee um, and I can be but I have to cultivate times of like joy and times of um, undirected creativity, creativity just because. Um, that's why you see me write like poems on social media all the time because I need to also engage in, okay, this caught my attention today. I'm gonna follow that. Um, it just keeps everything flowing for me. Uh, yeah, self-devotion could be a, a million different things. And it really, it's what makes you feel cherished and nourished? I think that's the best question. I really like the phrasing of self-devotion with that more than self-care because self-care almost, you know, I keep getting, you know, the first aid box pops into my head with self-care, right? right. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, and that's, you know, mm -hmm. it's really too late when you've got to bring out the bandages. <laughs> yes, exactly. And and also self-care has become such a capitalistic thing that it's just, you know, you need to buy the thing in order to care for yourself. You need to do this in order to in order for it to be right. And with the understanding of my ADHD diagnosis and probably other neurodivergence, those lists of self-care things I would do, but they never felt like they helped. Because it's just a list that people have made and it's mm. not actually taking into account what I need. 
Like I need sometimes to go off and be busy. Like resting for me isn't like sitting down. It is going someplace and getting inspired by, you know, one of my favorite things is to go to a thrift store and just to look around at all the things that are there. And for some reason that inspires me. And so that would be restful for me. That would be nourishing. Going to the ocean, nourishing. Don't have to do anything. I just need to be there. And I think it takes knowing yourself, which is always a thing. Um, and also trusting know yourself. what you want. <laughs> or at least gotta... be willing to try some things. Yeah. Because, you know, you got you don't always know until you know. So and... I mean, you're you're not like writing down from 12 to 1230, I'm having joy. No. Mm -mm. <laughs> Ideally, I'm not. Have I done that? <laughs> I'm yes. Sorry, I just I have sometimes. I I'm a, I will I like I am a recovering workaholic. I love to do. And once I got medicated for my brain, I was like, oh, I actually don't like to do that. I actually don't need to do that. Um, so now it comes a little bit more organically, but I used to. I used to like Look, write down, you know, you need to play. So well, I mean, I think that's good if 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 you're not involved in it, you have to start somewhere. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. oh, absolutely. You know, I mean you can't, yeah. you know start where you are you had to start where you were mm -hmm. and i think a lot of a lot of times we want to skip ahead <laughs> well i think and, we mm -hmm, sorry no no go ahead I'm, i think i think we want to have a perfect start sometimes and i think that that is like oh if i just started this way then it would all work out i'm and, gonna wait until i have all this before i do anything yes and so I was doing, I was leading some trance, I think, in the past weekend that I often do without notes. And something popped into my head that I think is kind of relevant. Uh, I was doing a trance for with the star goddess and sort of like creation and all of that. And the phrase that popped into my head was, you don't need to start over. You just need to keep going. And... I think that for me, when I even said that, because it wasn't planned, I just had a relaxing moment. Like, oh, everything still matters. I just need to keep going. Like, it's not about fixing something. It's about being committed to what's next. Adapt and overcome. Pretty much. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Throw a little jargon Military, in Military, absolutely. Yeah, it's yeah. just that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So with you being busy and doing all the things and being a jet mm -hmm. setter and seeing the world, mm -hmm. what is one thing that you haven't done that you've always wanted to do? Oh, I know exactly what the answer to this question is. Good. I have yet, I have yet to go to Greece. What? I have not gone. No, I was supposed to go this year and it's a long story, but it didn't, it didn't align with my values in terms of magic. And so I stepped out. And so that's the thing I really want to do that I haven't done. I would like to go to all these places that I've talked about. <laughs> I would like to give some offerings. My yeah. goodness. You can't really do magic in Greece. They're very um, not happy about it. Yeah. Um, doing things on their sites, but I think I have some ideas. Yeah. So you probably sneak, sneak, sneak one in. Pretty sure I can. Yeah. Just do pretty a walking. <laughs> yeah. So I would like to do that. I mean, I'd love to go to Aphrodite's rock and I would love to be in some temples and just sit there. I remember when I was in stationed in West mm -hmm. Germany. So that should <laughs> kind of date a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and I was over there and, you know, we'd get on a train and we'd go, you know, have a long weekend and we'd mm -hmm. be riding the train, you know, and you look up and there's cows and you ride a little longer and you look up and there's a castle. Mm -hmm. you, know? And, you know, we're just, you know, to us old is a hundred. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know. You know. To there, it's just a different, you know, they got eons, right? But I mean, it's because people were writing stuff down versus having mm -hmm. a normal tradition, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but, at the you know, going to Heidelberg and going to Neuschwanstein mm -hmm. and seeing, I mean, there, there's a feel to it, you know, because there's so much energy anchored into those mm -hmm. places that Absolutely. I have no idea what that place would, would some of those places would be like, but I would like to find out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, the first time I went to Glastonbury, 
I mean, this is, you know, the Glastonbury tour and Chalice Well and everything and all the stuff that I've read about. Um, and that was sort of the beginning of my witch career was sort of in that pantheon. To be there was just oh, like overwhelming. I, I mean, a lot of my ancestry is from that area too, but it was just, there's a feeling and there is a connection that is visceral. Um, I felt that the first time I went to Germany, like that's where a lot of my background is. And the first time I went there, I don't, I mean, I kind of know where my family's from, but not really. Um, but I could feel it when I was on the land. I was like, oh, this yes. feels familiar. It's different. Mm -hmm. You know, not to bring up a really ugly subject, but I did a tour of Dachau when I was over there. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Changed my life. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. You know, there's, I, I still have the PBGBs. Is that a word? PB, I'm using it. Mm -hmm. PBG it is, from that mm -hmm. place. Because it's just literally just bald almost the whole time I was there just for the yeah. feeling of the magnitude of evil, lack of a better word, the oppression. Of, it's just anyway. <laughs> yep. No, oh, yeah. I went to the Jewish Museum when I was in Berlin. And, yeah. Man. I, humans <laughs> suck sometimes. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. <laughs> um, So you've been on a path for a long time. Your mm -hmm. path has changed. I'm assuming <laughs> I'm, I'm going to assume over yes, over yes. time. If you could talk to someone that's fairly new mm -hmm. to the pra pagan practice, mm -hmm. once again, I'm using the umbrella. Okay. Yep. I'm not excluding you. I'm not using yes. exclusion anyway. What would you tell them for someone that's just starting out? What, what it, advice, nugget of wisdom would you offer? Uh, two things. First, it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay. Uh, I think a lot of folks hesitate to even get into paganism or magic or anything because they're afraid to make a mistake. And I still see it in classes. I still see it in moments where I say, it's okay to just try out something. Um, and I think a lot of that is remnants of, you know, patriarchy and all of that, that if you do something wrong, that you're wrong and a bad person. So number one, go ahead and make mistakes. It's fine. Um, it's going to be okay. And two, Think about building relationships um, with elements, with deities, whatever you want. Building relationships will create a much stronger foundation for how you interact than learning this, that, and the other correspondence. Um, figure out how you relate to water, how you relate to air, how you relate to fire, how you relate to earth, et cetera. Um, and really trust that and try out different things. Um, but I think, yeah, not making mistakes and building relationships are two of the biggest things that I think would have helped me starting out. Um, very afraid to screw up and offend somebody because I came from Catholicism. <laughs> and um, if I had realized that building relationships was not just something to do with humans, I think that would have expanded my practice a lot earlier. Yeah, I can see that. All right, so mm -hmm. uh, this is a question I ask everybody that comes on. Comes on. Um, so this is I'm going to call this a bonus question because we're already at our nine. So this is bonus. Right. Um, what's the one thing that each of us can do that can make community better? Mm -hmm. I the one thing that we can do is to listen more. Mm. I think listening is the thing. It's it's an art that is um, sometimes feels like it's out of fashion. I feel like a lot of times it's more valued when you speak. And I think it's actually more important to listen, uh, to listen to people's experience, to listen to how they've been impacted, to listen to what they want. It doesn't mean you need to agree with it, but I think listening creates such a better community foundation in which people feel safe and they feel like they belong. Hmm. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah. We're not, we're not good, great listeners. No. I, I, I think through the pandemic, once again, this is a judgment and I'm going to, I'm going to own it. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've forgotten yeah. how to have relationships. Yep. Mm -hmm. I think the pandemic has really kind of damaged it. Although zoom has been great. You know, I've really enjoyed being mm -hmm. able to talk with people from all over. It's sure. still hard to have, that relationship you know mm -hmm. at times too um so yeah i think that's that's huge mm -hmm. do you have a, a final thought or anything that you would like to add that we haven't talked about mm. as we head out 
what else could I say? What else is, um, well, this morning I was, I, I did a presentation on the norms with a group that's in India that often asked me to do presentations for them on my books. It's very cute. And it's been something that I've been doing for years with them. And I think I want to bring forward something that I talked about there. And very short version, the Norns are sort of the, the beings in Norse mythology that are sort of in charge of fate and destiny. And they are weaving and measuring and cutting the different threads that come, you know, that connect all of us into this life experience. What's important about this is to know that being woven together in this experience of time in this moment means that we're not alone mm. in any of this. It means that what you do will have an impact in some way. Now, good or bad, that's kind of de depends, right? Um, that's for other interpretations. But I think that I would love for folks to remember that we're all part of a web of actions and decisions and magic and story and family and et cetera. And that that doesn't mean that um, you have to do everything on your own, that you are actually connected enough and we're not alone in this strange world. Um, and your part matters. Oh, that's huge. Everybody matters. Mm -hmm. Anything you want to ask me on the way out? I give everybody one shot. <laughs> mm. And it's okay if you don't. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out how to phrase it. Um, just throw it against the wall. We'll see what sticks. What? Mm, what is the one thing that I haven't answered that you want me to answer that you'd oh. like to know more about? Or I can expand on or whatever. I think... One of my one of my life mentors was real mm. big into living courageously through the heart, yeah. you know, and having mm -hmm. an open heart. And he teaches it from a corporate level, mm -hmm. right? Which is yep. unusual because that's not that that's not our culture <laughs> mm -hmm. usually. Usually, so how can mm -hmm. we individually mm -hmm. practice that? Mm -hmm. What does that look like for us mm -hmm. to live with more heart? Mm -hmm. Give us some some uh, uh, mm -hmm. action step, uh, mm -hmm. some phrasing, some mm -hmm. something like that. Something that we can actively mm -hmm. do, so we can. Because I mean, you know, it's it's a muscle. Yeah, so you got to work it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, I think that to live from the heart or heart led magic or whatever you want to call it is where we all where we began all this. So here's the things that I would say, learn how to be devoted to yourself. First, devote to yourself. You are the, you are the being that um, when properly supported can do wondrous things in this world and will be regulated and aware and present for your own needs, your own desires and things that call your name. Two, uh, be willing to recognize that there is something bigger than you. I don't know. I don't care what you call it. I don't care what it looks like. It could be the ocean. It could be whatever, but be willing to also admit that maybe there's something that that's bigger than all this. And that's bigger than the everyday. And how do you interact with that? Um, how do you name that? How do you return to that? And I mean, this are all the action steps of heart magic. Third one is like, how do I, how can I serve in my community? How can I be of help? How can I be of assistance? Doesn't look the same for everything. Um, I think of, you know, activism, like, oh, I have to do this. You don't have to do that. There's many different things to do. There are many different ways. Just knowing your neighbors is a way. Um, engaging in mutual aid opportunities is also a way. Um, there are ways for you to also put forward your talents and your energy to help a community as a whole. Um, and I think with all of that, that 
those are the different buckets or the different valves or ventricles or all the parts of the heart that keep things going and that can inform whatever your heart needs. I, I like I like it because I've it's something that I kind of always teach. You know, I use it from my own personal experiences being in the service, right? I was in a combat mm -hmm. unit. Yes. But in the army, only like 25% or less are actually combat. Mm -hmm. So it takes 75% of the army to make the 25% work. Exactly. You know, and not everybody needs to be on the front line, you know, or should be. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of need in, you know, mail is really important in mm -hmm. that in that theater. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Getting mm -hmm. letters from home is important. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. Food. food is huge. <laughs> Be surprised mm -hmm. at how important food is mm -hmm. when you ain't got it. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, so, I mean, there's a lot of different ways of, of like you said, of, of working within your community, bringing whatever talent you have, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. to bear to help. Yeah, whatever resources you have. Not everybody has the same resources and that's, or abilities or want or desire. I also often say that, you know, do, showing up in community is finding the one thing that you're really passionate about and following that. You can't do everything. Yeah. You can't. I can't have, you know, I can ha hold a general concern for the whole world. I cannot attend to everything. Um, so, you know, I have certain causes uh, or activism directions that are that I focus on more than others and that's just because that's that's my part of the weird my part of the web to mm -hmm. yank on so oh yeah I think it's, it's sometimes it's probably easier to say than than actually do oh, so true so true <laughs> I know and I'm looking forward to this uh love spell book Someday. paper yeah <laughs> paper, thesis <laughs> Whatever. Uh -huh. I, 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 there's some juiciness in that, I think. I, I'm I'm kind of digging it. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for I, giving I us a too. glimpse. Mm -hmm. Thanks for giving yeah. us a glimpse. Thanks for taking time. I mean, it's just yeah. this has been lovely. We have interacted a lot mm -hmm. through technology, but never actually yeah. had a conversation. So thank you so much for um, um, blessing us with, with your yeah. time. I appreciate it. Thank you for asking. I, I've have, been wanting to do this for a while. So, yes. And I'll have all your contact information down in the show notes so everybody can get with you. Um, and you, you yeah, you got to get you got to it, listening to me. You got to go check her out. Yeah, you, you got to. She's just she's the deal. She's a, there's those folks that are there, and then there's those that are involved. <laughs> you know, and I you know I see people right, and I I I'm, you can tell who's involved. So thank you for being involved. We we need. We need more yeah. involvement. We do. We do. We do. Listening. I like that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs>